you so much for visiting our channel. We are IFGF Los Angeles, and we are one church that meets in four campuses across Los Angeles. If you want more information on how to attend one of our services or how to get connected with our church, please visit ifgfla.com. This message was recently filmed in our Monrovia campus and features our senior pastor, Daniel Hanafi. We hope you are blessed. together for greater blessing 2020 how many of you received that how many are you ready to a greater blessing hallelujah praise the lord wow i was i i i, I don't say this often but i was blessed by the announcement wow that's some prophetic announcement right there brooke prophesied and she didn't get weird you know it's like that's that's just awesome today i i, I have a message for you that is also um, I want you to know this right in the front because uh, you listen to, uh, to this, uh, you, 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 you have to understand where it's coming from. It's a prophetic message. What is a prophetic message? You know, a prophetic, a prophet gives the word of God for right then, right there, for that situation, for that season, for that specific people, right? So it's not canned or it's not, it's not we, we, we don't approach the, 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 the messages Planning the whole year, and we just we just preach the whole book of whatever, which is a good uh, a discipline to study the Bible methodically. But we have to realize also that God is alive, and He wants to talk to us every day. Yes. Amen. Amen. So prophets are not weird, you know. It's it's the prophetic ministry in the church is absolutely essential. Amen. So I believe uh, this happens about what a couple of weeks ago as I was praying about what God is speaking to us through greater blessing. I feel the Lord drop this, this, this verses into my heart uh, as, a, as a prophetic message for all of you. So it's not just a Bible study, okay? It, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a prophetic message, and you have to listen to it in that way. Now, uh, the first part of the message, it will, it will feel a little bit like a Bible study. The reason I'm doing that is because I need to cover all the uh, theological groundwork so that you know that this is theologically sound. Because you cannot just grab stuff from the Bible and just apply it uh, in your life uh, for your convenience or for whatever you want. You cannot do that either. So some people get into the habit of quote-unquote spiritualizing passages in the Bible to whatever suits their needs. That's not a good practice. But that's why I'm going to establish it in the beginning so that you understand that this is theologically sound. But then when I get into the, 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 the second part, which is the, the meat of the message, I want you to tune in to the Holy Spirit. And I want you to listen to it not just with your intellect, but with your spirit activated, receiving the word from the Lord. Because what's going to happen is every single one of you is going to have different kind of emphasis and applications from the Holy Spirit for your own life. You're going to hear on your own, on your own. I'm going to speaking, be speaking the word as I hear it from the Lord, as it is in the Bible. But then the Lord, if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, God's going to activate something in your, in, in your heart in a very specific way. So I don't want you to miss that because God is here. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm hearing stuff here, but um, I guess it's okay. Praise the Lord. All right. Here it is. Okay. This is the verse that I receive for our congregation for this year at this time. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 18. Can we read it together with a loud voice, please? One, two, and three. This is what the Lord says. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents and have compassion on his dwellings. The city will be rebuilt on her ruins and the palace will stand in its proper place. From them will come songs of thanksgiving and the sound of rejoicing. I will add to their numbers and they will not be decreased. I will bring them honor, and they will not be disdained. 
their children will be as in days of old, and their community will be established before me. Amen. This is for, for you. This is for the church. Amen. Hallelujah. So, the first part here. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents. Right? Let's talk about Jacob's tents for a little bit. You know, whenever the, in the Bible it says Jacob's tents, it is a phrase that refers to the tribes of Israel or Jacob's sons. Now, as you know, the 12 tribes of Israel are the children of Jacob. Right? So, when we talk about Jacob's tents, it's talking about the tribes of Israel. So, in the original context, of course, in Jeremiah here, it is a prophecy concerning Israel. Now, we're not Israelites here. So I want you to understand you cannot just apply things that belong to some other people to yourself. But this is talking about the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, obviously, because uh, Abraham is the grandfather of Jacob, and it's talking about the people of God. Now, God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they and their descendants will be God's people. That's a big covenant there because Abram was taken out from his family for God to start a new nation. It's God's people, beginning with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And every time he's called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And these people that are is called out and given a new name, given a new identity, a people that will be blessed in a special way by God, protected by God, provided by God. Right? I know what you're thinking. That sounded a lot like us. Yeah, that's, that's right. We're going to get there. But first of all, uh, of course, you know the, 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 the covenant that he made with Abraham, Genesis 12, 2, I will make you into a great nation. You see, he's starting a new nation. I will make you into a great nation. It's a new thing. And I will bless you. Everything starts with God's initiative, blessing them. I will make your name great, so new identity, and you will be a blessing. This, this new nation is so blessed, that, and it becomes a, a blessing for other people. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That was the covenant. Now, it's interesting how, how, how powerful covenants are. Because later on, there's this rogue prophet named Balaam. Uh, he's probably Indonesian because he, he got bribed. You know, it's like, <laughs> I know I shouldn't, be, I shouldn't be talking about Indonesia like that. We are changing. Indonesia is changing. But the Indonesia, when I grew up in, it was very corrupt. Everybody is bribed, right? Every, bribery is everywhere. Um, and um, uh, this guy was bribed, Balaam was bribed to curse Israel. So he went up on the mountain and he started cursing Israel. But what's really funny is, as he wants to curse Israel, the words that came out of his mouth was this. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob. <laughs> your dwelling places, Israel. Like valleys, they spread out like gardens beside a river. Like aloe, uh, aloes planted by the Lord like cedars beside the waters. And he's like, ah, what's going on with my mouth? You can't curse God's people. God, God's covenant with his people is strong. It's not a wimpy covenant, a fragile covenant that can get, you know, you know, just destroyed by the slightest of curses. I mean, look, he want to curse Israel. What came out of his mouth is blessing. Do you know that that's a powerful thing about the people of God, huh? Some people come to me like, oh, you know, I think I need a special prayer because, um, I, you know, some people probably are, are putting spell on me or whatever. Look, look, look. Don't, don't get so nervous, okay? If you're a people of God, Proverbs says this, a curse without cause cannot stick. A curse without cause cannot stick, will not stick. You can, you know, look, you don't even have to be, Part, you don't have to do anything. 
Just don't, don't give cause for the devil to put uh, you know, his, his, his foothold on you. That's all you have to do. And you can be just going your merry way your whole day and people try to do harm to you. Nothing will happen to you. Happened to me so many times. I guess, I don't know why, but a lot of people, no, I, I wouldn't confess to a lot of people, but more than a few people want to kill me, <laughs> which is not nice. But they did. But these two instances, I know for sure, <laughs> it happened. You know, I was preaching, both of them in Borneo, by the way. It's crazy island. And, you know, some of you come from that crazy island here. But, but Borneo, man, two times they tried to kill me. How do I know that? Because the next morning, this guy, a guy came. He said, I'm the assistant of this witch doctor here. And uh, I want to receive Jesus. Oh, yeah, why? Because uh, my boss tried to kill you last night, and now he's dead. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Twice. One, the first time I feel it, you know, I was preaching. There's like an oppression, heat. You know, I feel very weak and hot. But I just preach. The next day, the guy is dead. The next time I was preaching, now that I feel it right here, like like there is a something that was grabbing my chest. Nothing much. I was like, you know, I was scratching it and things like that. It doesn't go away, so I keep on preaching. The next day, the guy came, said, "My boss is dead. He sent you the claw of the bear or whatever, some fancy uh, Marvel uh, imagination, but." I, you know, I was just scratching it. I mean, like, it, he tried to rip, he was trying to rip your heart out. Oh, wow, what a fanciful imagination you have. Now you're dead. A curse without cause cannot stick. I wasn't even thinking about that. Not that I'm some powerful, you know, sorceress or <laughs> anything like that. But God, your God and his covenant with you is very powerful. Amen. Amen. I just to restore some, some faith and confidence there, amen. Look at this guy, how beautiful and authentic. By the way, I choose these verses because it shows also Jacob's stance. It's always talking about the people of God, right? So I'm showing you references here, Jacob's stance. So when I say Jacob's stance, you understand, talking about the people of God. Now, um, how does that relate to us then? Because Jacob is Jacob. We are not Jew. At least most of us are not. But how does that relate to the church? Okay, I'm glad you asked. So here's the answer. Galatians chapter 3 verse 7. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. So can you be a child, children of Abraham uh, without being a children of Jacob? Yes, if you're an Edomite. We're not Edomite. <laughs> Edom married Ishmael and become that whole type of people. But spiritually speaking, we're talking about faith that comes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The nation of Israel is a picture of the people of God right now. Here it is. Those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles, that's me, because I'm not Jew, would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. Oh, so that covenant in Genesis 12 is actually the gospel. Yeah, all nations will be blessed through you. Oh, I understand now the greatest blessing that, that was supposed to be, to be announced through Israel was salvation. Okay, all nations will be blessed through you. So who those who rely on faith are blessed, what? What's that word? Along with Abraham. So in other words, if you are a people of faith, every time the Bible talks about the blessings of Abraham, it applies to you. Hello? Yeah, are you convinced? Is it, is it yours? Do you have a, a, a right to claim that? Right? Without being a charismaniac. Right? It's theologically, theologically sound that every blessing promised to Abraham 
you are blessed along with him because you are people of faith receiving the gospel. We are blessed by, by, by the, the blessing of salvation. He redeemed us. Are you redeemed? In order that, what? Why are you redeemed? In order that the blessing given to Abraham, what? Come on, talk to me. Might come to the Gentiles, that's me, through, have you received Christ Jesus? That's it. If you have received Christ Jesus, guess what? All the blessings of Abraham is yours. All right? I just shown you, just from scriptures, that you have good theological standing here. You're not just grabbing, name it, claim it, grab it, blab it, you know, blab it, grab it, whatever. And all those, all those things that is accused of some, we're, we're not doing that. We're not doing that at all. We have good theological grounds to receive these blessings that are written in the, in the Old Testament for, uh, 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 for, for the Israelites because of this verse. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's yours. Come on, say it. It's mine. It's mine. Hallelujah. Just in case you're not completely convinced that we and that Israel and the church, you know, Israel was the people of God. Then they got fired. Matthew 21. They got fired in Matthew 21. You can read it later on. And then what? The people of God is the, the title of people of God was given to the church. Amen. It's also in Matthew 21. Uh, you don't believe me. Okay, here it is. <laughs> Israel, the church. They just came out from, the, from Egypt. Okay? They're in front of Mount Sinai. And uh, God met with Moses. It says in verse 3, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob. Okay? This is to the descendants of Jacob. We're talking about Jacob's stance, remember? To the descendants of Jacob. And what you are to tell the people of Israel is this, verse 4. <coughs> you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And then verse 5. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's what he said to Israel. Right? To the descendants of Jacob. After they crossed the Red Sea. You will, out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I told you earlier that they got fired in Matthew 21. And the mandate was given, the privilege was given to the church. How do I know that? Well, here it is. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, the book of 1 Peter was written by Peter to the first church in Jerusalem, right? Right? Okay, so what does, what does, it, say, does it say here? So Peter is telling the church now, not just Jews, all kinds of people in the church, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Does it sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? Now how can, how can, you know, it's almost like, how can you say these things to two different people at the same time? No, the, the answer is this. It was not said at the, at the, at the same time. It was one after the other. So when Israel was fired, then the spiritual Israel is the church. That's why, did you notice the, all those colors that I put up there? I want you to compare colors. It's not just random colors because I was feeling colorful. <laughs> but start noticing something. Out of all nations, on the other side here, chosen people. 
treasured possession. On the other side, special possession. Kingdom of priests. On the other side is what? Royal priesthood. Holy nation. On the other side, holy nation. Do you see that these are the same attributes? Yeah? So can I establish now that the church takes the place of the people of God that was held by Israel before Matthew 21? Are you convinced now? Therefore, the promises of God to Israel is also ours. This was given to the descendants of Jacob. So, when we talk about Jacob's tents, can you apply it to the church? Come on, give me a resounding yes. <laughs> Amen. All right, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to really, look, look, I understand that, uh, well, how can you just grab something from the book of Jeremiah and uh, without... Go, just grab something out of the context and apply what you want. You take the nice piece. Yes, yeah, I understand. I understand the book of Jeremiah, 90% filled with judgment. It is a sad book. I don't like the book. It's full of threats and uh, promises of, of calamities. And it ends in chapter 52 with it really happening. <laughs> right? So, yeah, I understand why... You are, some of us might be skeptical, like, how can you just grab chapter 30? Because the only good part in Jeremiah is chapter 30, 31, and 32. That's the only good part. The rest is really depressing reading. <laughs> I understand. This is the, this is the, the, the uh, uh, outline. It starts with Jeremiah's call. Very depressing. I'm calling you to people that will never listen to you. Why are you calling me then? Okay, but that's besides the point, right? <laughs> Jeremiah was called by God and he did not hide the fact that no matter what he does, the whole ministry, nobody's going to ever listen to him. And everything that he's warning the people about is going to happen anyway. I would have walked out and given up if I was Jeremiah. <laughs> but but that's, that's what it is. It's just very depressing. You know, and then it talks about idolatry. It talks about idolatry. You know, corrupt leadership, moral compromise, exhortation to Judah, promises of restoration. Right there, chapter 30 to 33, the only good part. Then fall of Jerusalem and the aftermath, right? And then prophecy, prophecies against all the nations, a sobering ending, Jerusalem in ruins. So, why, why can't we just take that promise out of the whole thing? No, we're not taking it out of the whole thing. All the warnings are still valid. You know what they were doing at that time? They were worshiping God like normal, right? All the, all the, all the sacrifices still going on, all the, all the ceremonies, everything is going on. But outside the temple gates, they were doing something completely different. They were worshiping other gods. Even to the point of sacrificing children as burnt offerings to the God of Molech. Doing both. That's what they were doing. So I will tell you today, if you choose to do that, <laughs> and you said, but pastor, you talk about Jeremiah 30. Yeah. Yeah. The difference between that whole book and now is this. Jesus happened. So even though we've done all that, the payment was paid by Jesus. All right? And so I want to tell you with good theological conviction that the promises are still as valid as ever for us. The promises of the restoration, that's what he wants to do. Amen. So yeah, I understand the whole book of Jeremiah. However, the promises of God still remains true if you do not walk away from him. Look, I believe in grace. But God's grace, you can only receive God's grace if you receive God. You cannot receive God's grace and not receive God as your God. 
Some people go so extreme with grace. I can do whatever, whatever, and I, look, if you don't accept God's God in your life as your Lord, you don't accept his lordship in your life, you don't accept his word as the authority in your life, hey, don't get fooled thinking that you're going to be covered by God's grace. You are not covered by God's grace if you do not accept God. You can only accept God's grace if you accept God. Very important. Now, the Old Testament is really the New Testament revealed. And the New Testament is, is the, no, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So, we can learn from this when we talk about Jacob's stand. It's talking about you. It's talking about us. It's talking about the church. It's interesting. Sometimes we're called children of Abraham. But then we call it Jacob's tent. I think it gives a little bit a different emphasis. When we're talking about the children of Abraham, talking about the covenant people of faith, when we talk about Jacob's tent, I think the, the emphasis on Jacob is probably talking about grace. Because the name Jacob means the supplanter. I looked it up in the dictionary to have an accurate definition of what a supplanter is. It, it says that in Webster Dictionary that a supplanter is someone who took someone else's place wrongfully. Someone who takes some, some other, you know, someone else's place wrongfully. Of course, he took Esau's place as firstborn and received the blessings that he didn't deserve. I don't know how many of you think that sounded just like me. I took somebody else's place, somebody else's place. Jesus took my place wrongfully. I should die for my sin. But he stepped in and he died for my sin. Sounded so much like Jacob. And if you look at his story, it's like that too. I mean, he doesn't deserve it. He just cheated his father, cheated his brother. So he was running. He was running away and he, he got so exhausted running away. And then he lay down. His head was on a stone. That's what happened for people that cheated. You know, they, you, you, you will not have a good night's sleep. You feel like you're sleeping on a pillow of stone. And then he got a dream. Now, the dream was given by God. Yeah, if, if I was God... That's not going to be the dream I'm going to give to him. Did you, anybody remember what kind of dream Jacob got from God? It was a nice dream. It was a ladder, angels descending, ascending. The house of God is there. And he woke up, this place is the house of God. And he called the name of the place Bethel, means the house of God. How can you just, you just cheated your dad, you just cheated your brother, you're running away. And suddenly, you're accepted in the house of God with nothing. No reparations, no nothing. I would have given him a different dream. Chased by an alligator, chased by a snake. And when, just when he thought he escaped them, he got grabbed by a lion. That would be a fitting dream for him if I were God. <laughs> I've, you know, I'd, he wouldn't listen to my advice. That's grace. That's not talking about grace, right? We get what we don't deserve. How many, are, how many would admit that where you are right now, you got what you don't deserve? Would you admit that? So we're Jacobs then. Then we're good candidates for this promise. Amen. <laughs> it's grace. Ephesians 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That was me. That was me. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's me. That's all of us. 
if you would be humble enough to admit it, amen. We're just like Jacob. But 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's me. That's me too. Amen. Because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Thank God that's us. Amen. We're just like Jacob. Amen. And then it talks about tents. Tents talks about pilgrimage. Tents talking about people on the move. People who are not settled. They're often referred to by the use of the word tent. In Hebrews 11, 9, speaking of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Bible says, By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. So, that's talking about us also. Amen. Paul refers to our bodies as tents. 2 Corinthians 5.1, For we know that if the early tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Talking about our lives here, Paul calls it tent. Paul also taught that our lives on earth is a journey and it is temporary. Philippians 3.20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven. Jesus also said in John 15.18, if the world hates you, keep in mind that he hated, they hated it, me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. In Gethsemane, John chapter 17, he says, verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. We are a people on a journey also. Jacob talks about us. Living in tents talks about us. Amen. So now... Are you convinced then that the, what's following, all the promises that's following is for you? Did I establish a good theological foundation for that? All right. So what does, this, what, what does it say? Now, turn on your spiritual, your, turn on your spirit to his spirit. Because he will speak to you as I speak these, these words right from the verse that we read just now. God will speak to you. And impress upon your spirit his promises for you in 2020. Here's the first one. City rebuilt on her ruins. And palace that will stand in its proper place. What this is talking about is God will have mercy on Jacob's descendants. And they will one day move out of their tents or their pilgrim identity into their dwelling places. You see, we are aliens in this world. But that doesn't mean we are refugees. I hope you know the difference. Alien is not refugee. We are aliens. But God will rebuild the city. On her, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Near East or in, in those ancient times, when a city is sacked and destroyed... The habit is they built on top of the heap of the rubble. They built on top of it. For some uh, uh, symbolic reasons, but also for some practical reasons. They don't want to waste all those good foundations that are already there. Good building materials are there. And it raises up the foundation higher so it is less prone to flooding like what's happening in Jakarta right now. So that's some practical reasons. But there's also some symbolic reasons right there. What this is talking about, I don't know how many of you will, when, when I read this thing, a city built on her ruins, say, in, say to yourself, my life is in ruins. Some of you are saying that. Maybe your health is in ruins. Maybe your marriage is in ruins. Maybe there's other areas in your life that are in ruins. It's been destroyed by the enemy. You know what God is saying? 
He's not going to move to another spot to build. He's going to build it right there. He's going to build a new Jerusalem on top of the sack destroyed old Jerusalem. He's going to build right on top of that ruins. It's going to happen. A palace will stand in its proper place. He's talking about the palace here is another translation talks about the temple. He's talking about the, the religious ceremonies that were just completely destroyed. It will be put in place. You're gonna, God is going to reestablish your, your secret time with him. You're going to build an altar in your life. Your Bible reading, your devotion time. It's going to be established by, Lord, by the Lord. This is one, one promise I'm, I'm holding on for this year, for this congregation right here, for you. That all of you will have your private life with God. You're not just going to have just one snack a week like this. No, no, no. You're going to have good hot meals every single day, spiritually speaking. I'm saying even the minute you wake up in the morning, I don't know how, but God is going to give you the grace to wake up earlier. Because that's going to be part of the most important part of your day this year. That you're going to wake up and you're thinking about him. And you're going to hear from him. And you're going to read the word. And God is going to speak to you. And God is going to activate promises in your life that you may have forgotten. And then you, you're, going to, you're going to gain that, that faith. Do you know that faith is also a spiritual gift? There's faith, but then there's faith. Spiritual gift. And it's going to be poured out to you right there in the morning as you are just thinking about God and worshiping God. And bam, suddenly you're going to have that faith for something that you never had faith for it before. It's going to happen. The palace will stand in its proper place. city will be rebuilt on her ruins. Amen. I'm so excited about this because the devil is speaking like this. I've ruined your, your life in this area. You're not going to ever recover from that. It's a lie. Your mess does become your message. Your test does become your testimony. Your pain will become your purpose. Hallelujah. And your trials will become your triumph. And instead of being a victim, it's going to take you into victory. It will happen. Then what comes out is this. Songs of thanksgiving and the sounds of rejoicing. Do you know that that just sounds like a church I want to go to? <laughs> Uh, it's the, corp the corporate culture. I believe that's going to be the culture of this church. The one thing that is predominant in this church will be this. Songs of thanksgiving and sounds of rejoicing. Yeah. It's going to be a happy church, folks. Yeah. We're going to be a, you know what? We're going to be a thankful church. Not because we will it. Because there's going to be plenty of the cost for it. Amen. We're going to be, we can't help but be thankful. We can't help but rejoice. That's going to be the sound of this church. I'm speaking to all of us. You know, there's so many kinds of churches out there. There's, there's the angry church. You know, they're angry at everything. They're angry at the Democrats. They're angry at whatever. They're angry at, uh, the, they're, they're angry at the abortion clinics. They're angry. I mean, it's all righteous causes and all that. But they're angry. And everybody's our militants there. You know. They're angry at the Christmas tree. They're angry at the mistletoe, whatever it is. They're, they're angry at Halloween. I mean, look, I, I don't participate in Halloween, but I'm not angry. When people come take a treating to my house. I have, I have a lot. You know, when I bought, I bought candies, and I didn't buy the cheap one on sale. I bought Kit Kat. Because <laughs> I'm not going to be a jerk on Halloween. Even though I do not believe in Halloween, I do not Celebrate Halloween when people, when kids come, I give them Kit Kats and they go, whoa! Should be a happy church. Why are we so 
intimidated by all those things. I mean, but it's pagan. I eat pagan for breakfast. I have the spirit of the Lord in me. I'm not afraid of pagans. Let me, let me tell you. You know, the word that, God, that Paul used for God is theos in the New Testament, right? Do you know the root of that word is from? Zeus. Zeus. He's not afraid of Zeus. People, but people are worshiping Zeus as a false god. Yeah. I take it. I redeem it because I'm more powerful than it. Amen. You don't have to be afraid of any of those things. We can be just thankful and joyful and be people that people like to hang out with. Some people, some churches are scared churches. Oh, they keep talking about the, the prophecy, end time prophecies and this and that. And it's like, dude, man, let's, let's live. Let's be a light. Let's be salt. Let's be an influencer. Let's bring impact to this world. Amen. Amen. Songs of thanksgiving and songs of rejoicing. I will add to their numbers and they will not be decreased. Come on, everybody. Our God is a God of increase. He's not a God of decrease. A God of increase. In case of goodness, not increase in blood pressure and cholesterol, things like that. No, no, no. We are talking about good increases, right? Increase in HDL, not the LDL. Yeah, am I right? Yeah. Increase in HDL, not LDL. Hallelujah. I will add to their numbers. This church is going to add members. It's not just going to be filled with crowd. It's going to increase with disciples. How is that going to happen? How is God, is, there, is God gonna drop some disciples here? No. Do you know where disciples come from? They come from disciples. Because disciples make disciples. Yes. Hallelujah. Come on now. Come on now. That's talking about you. Say, it's me, it's me, it's me. Yes. Hallelujah. Because your spiritual life will be so healthy, so good, your walk with God will be so good that it spills out. And you become an influencer without even trying. That's what's going to happen. I will add to their numbers. And they will not be decreased. Hallelujah. Yeah, the end times will see evil rise. But it will also see God's kingdom rise even more. Hallelujah. We will experience this. The Lord will add to our numbers. With converts. People being baptized. People being Receive into the beloved, into the fellowship. There will be an increase in care groups, increase in leadership, increase in ministers. Your walk will increase. Your closeness with God will increase. Your, pro, your productivity for the kingdom of God will increase. Because that's the promise of God. That's what God wants. He is a God of increase, not a God of decrease. I will bring them honor and they will not be disdained. With that increase, there will be honor. People in our community will honor this church. It will not disdain us. Hallelujah. The house of the Lord will be respect, respected. Their children will be as in days of old. When the Bible talks about children, it's talking about blessings. Because in a family, children are such blessings. They will be like the children will be as in days of old, meaning it will, be, it will be good, it will be wholesome, it will be blessed by the Lord. It's a blessing for a nation, it's a blessing for a community, it's a blessing for a home, it's a blessing for a church. This corresponds with Isaiah prophecy in Isaiah 54 verse 1. Sing, O barren, thou that did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You that did not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. The community will be established before me. Amen. An established congregation. It's uh, talking about the congregation being secure, stable, fixed, planting roots. Amen. I hope... You have experienced something, as I mentioned all these things, that the components of this 
of this promise from the Lord for 2020 for you. Greater blessing. And I want you to grab hold of it. This is prophetic. This is a prophetic message. I want to receive it prophetically and live it out. And in that way, you establish. That's the answer to this prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How does he exert his will on earth? Through you. When you grab hold of the prophetic promises of God and you believe it and you walk it and God supplies the strength, God supplies the miracles, God supplies the power and then his kingdom is established on this earth. Would you stand with me? Now, I want you I want you to read this thing one more time and then we're going to sing that song. Oh, what a powerful song that is. The goodness of God. You believe that God is good? Yes. He's not just God. He's a good God. Right? And this is a good promise. And he's giving you this promise for you for this year. Let's read it together one more time. One, two, and three. This is what the Lord says. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents and have compassion on his dwellings. The city will be rebuilt on his ruins and the palace will stand in its proper place. From them will come songs of thanksgiving and the sound of rejoicing. I will add to their numbers and they will not be decreased. I will bring them honor and they will not be disdained. Their children will be as in days of old, and their community will be established before me. We receive that, God. We receive this, God. We receive this, God. Hallelujah.